Today we are pleased to introduce Joe Kapler as part of the Wisconsin Historical Museum's History Sandwiched In Lecture Series. Joe is the Wisconsin Historical Society's Curator of Cultural History. He's been with the Society since 2001 and oversees a wide variety of Society collections including paintings, furniture, and decorative arts, as well as developing content for exhibitions, publications, and other Society initiatives. Here today to explore the history of the Evergleam Aluminum Christmas Tree, please join me in welcoming Joe Kapler. I want to echo Katie's comments there regarding the cold weather. Uh, seems seasonally appropriate, but thank you for taking the time and making the effort to come in today. I generally work at the Stork Society's headquarters building, which is eight blocks away on Library Mall, so I make the trek back and forth up and down State Street an awful lot, and today was particularly brisk. <laughs> Didn't matter which direction you were facing either, the wind was in your face. So. Uh, I will talk today for uh, 35, 40 minutes, and we'll talk about, uh, obviously, why we're all here, shiny aluminum Christmas trees. Leave a little time for Q&A, and if you have to leave uh, before one, if you have to leave at one o'clock, uh, feel free, please do so, and I'll stick around for more questions and answer uh, after that. And then, um, obviously, since what we're talking about is right outside the doors, I encourage you to take the advantage of the opportunity while you're here and visit the exhibition. So Katie mentioned a little bit of my background and, and I don't know where aluminum Christmas trees fall into art, decorative arts, material culture, and I'm not sure it matters because it's one heck of a great story. And uh, let's not classify it too much and let's just talk about a great Wisconsin story, a great Wisconsin business story, really. So here they are, aluminum Christmas trees. And these are three uh, from the Wisconsin Historical Society Museum's uh, permanent collection. Actually, three of the more special trees. Color, true taper on the far right. You learn a little bit about that guy uh, as well. Uh, this is our sixth exhibition on, on these trees, either featuring or including lunar Christmas trees uh, since, since 2005. And then this year, this year, a, a different theme to it. And, We've titled the exhibition Ever Gleaming, obviously a clear play on, on the brand name, uh, and the tagline, The Enduring Love Affair with the Aluminum Christmas Tree. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of conclude with, with why we picked that tagline. Uh, but here we are in 2016, and we're still talking about them, and we're probably talking about them more now than perhaps even they were spoken about then. Um, so let's start our journey. I'm just gonna run through here real quick uh, kind of some key dates, and then the rest of the presentation will be, will be fleshing these, these points out. Uh, but just to kind of set the stage uh, uh, regarding the trees and their kind of their place in American history, uh, they're often confused as 1950s aluminum tree, in their 1960s, really. And that's because in December of 1958, the head of sales for aluminum specialty company, uh, aluminum goods and manufacturing novelty household goods company uh, out of Manitowoc, had already been in business for over, a little over 50 years at that point. Um, their head of sales is down in Chicago, going by a Ben Franklin, uh, looking in the storefront and sees a shiny aluminum Christmas tree. And hmm, we make aluminum products, we make aluminum Christmas decorations. Buys one, takes it back to uh, Manitowoc and has the engineers look at this, kind of deconstruct it. Uh, the one that was in Chicago was made by Modern Coatings Incorporated, another aluminum goods type of company, and they, they made and sold early trees, and uh, early relative to the story. And Luna Specialty thought maybe we could do a little better, a little more affordable, uh, and they had lots of reasons to think that, and we'll, we'll see them as they play out. Um, and so they quick in a, a couple, couple months banged out a prototype uh, in time for the New York Toy Fair, which is going to be in March of 1959. And this is, this is where the Christmas season decorations, toys, all that is, is launched. Manufacturers, makers of toys and goods and re uh, products and Christmas paper and all that meet with retailers, you know, buyers for retailers, and they meet in New York and they do this in March, ahead of the following December's Christmas season. 
the tree was a big hit amongst the buyers. And they making order, taking orders right there and then kind of getting a gauge. Uh, retailers know their customers. That's, that's the, the idea there. And Luna Specialty thought, hmm, this, this could be, they, they threw out many ideas a year and even prototype a fewer number, but still, this one, this could be good. So they made a couple hundred thousand in the summer and fall of 1959 on a hunch, really, <laughs> uh, but an informed and, and reasoned hunch. And then first year, 1959, Christmas, they sold those trees. And people loved them, and then they knew they had something to work with, and they're an they were an innovative company, and nimble, and we're going to see how they uh, refine this product and took a good idea and, and to make it a great idea. Took a you know, $100 idea and made it a million-dollar idea. So then throughout the uh, 1960 season on, massive uh, innovation, massive output. Uh, in the peak years in the early 60s, three shifts, uh, having trouble securing storage space, so they would store trees in boxcars of trains uh, before they could get shipped out. Uh, and then accessorize, accessorize, right? Uh, all the uh, accompanying accessories to these trees to animate them. Uh, and we'll, we'll see what some of those look like. And that happened in the early 1960s. Um, sales peaked probably about 1964. But throughout the decade, uh, diversification of tree type, styles, colors. We'll see a whole bunch of those here. And obviously, we have uh, a really nice representation, 30 trees in total, including uh, the wonderful trees out on the front window facing Capitol Square from viewable from the sidewalk. If you haven't seen those, if you missed those, those are really great trees. And, and they show kind of the depth and the range of their versatility. Luna Specialties, the versatility. Uh, 1965, uh, the trees are becoming popular. That They're getting into the American pop cultural consciousness and had, a, had an appearance on Charlie Brown Christmas special. And we'll talk about that and whether or not it had an effect. The late 60s, uh, specialty along with other makers uh, of trees. Uh, by this time, there are 12, 15 or so different makers of aluminum Christmas trees around the country, uh, including also Murrow in, in Manitowoc, also making trees. So two Wisconsin companies. But aluminum specialty is kind of the, the Evergreen was kind of the Coca-Cola of the marketplace, 60, 65% of the marketplace sales. Um, others started making... Uh, artif real artificial trees in that they were meant to mimic an evergreen tree. Plastic, vinyl, easy to use, that type of thing. So declining sales, declining interest for a variety of reasons. Uh, and production ceased around 1971, 1972. So keep some of these dates in the back of your head because we're going we're gonna to come back to them. Uh, and then these trees kind of faded away into attics or basement storage closets and or the garbage or in the people's memories and uh, it wasn't until the early 1990s that uh, a pair of Manitowoc uh, photographer artists educators instructors began to collect the trees they're from Manitowoc they knew of the story began to collect the trees document the story uh, through their wonderful images uh, and we'll meet them uh, in a bit here shortly and uh, they published the story, the first publication kind of post-contemporary. Um, it was in 1997, a very small magazine uh, they published in 1997, and then turned that effort into the book Seasons Gleamings in 2004. And uh, I doubt we're here today, and those trees are in there today, or on sale on eBay, if it wasn't for the book Seasons Gleamings and, we'll, and, and the result of attention and coverage and um, that it received. <laughs> uh, and starting in 2005, uh, we did uh, our first exhibition. We scrambled to get eight trees. We thought that was pretty great. Uh, we didn't yet know the scope and scale of this story of specialties output. Uh, so we, we were thinking it's pretty good. And to get to 30 now, we're, uh, we're proud of that. Um, uh, 20 plus are in the permanent education collections of the Wisconsin Historical Society. And then there's some other trees that come from private collections uh, as well. So we're going to take a little trip back to the early 1960s here in the upper left. 
That's the, uh, that's the sales crew, 1962 at the New York Toy Fair. And yes, it looks exactly like Mad Men. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if the producers went to this image, which is online, uh, and you'll see uh, one of the whippersnapper sales crew right here, Jerry Walk. So this is 1962. Jerry um, worked the central part of the United States, Ohio, and uh, selling to retailers. And he was pretty, pretty innovative in his sales concepts and ideas and moved a lot of trees. So at lower right, that's Jerry right there in front of the room, now head of sales for the toy division. Trees were good to Jer Jerry. was good to trees, and trees were good to Jerry. Jerry is addressing buyers there in that image. If you look, they're in, uh, in the background there. 19, this is 1969, so uh, you see uh, Evergleams as well as their new, uh, here you see their new, um, their new artificial trees in the back as well. What were they selling? And so following, we're going to look through here a, a bunch of uh, catalog pages that were graciously made available to us by collectors, people who collect trees or accessories or the catalogs. There isn't, from a historian's standpoint, there isn't the pile of documentation and company records to go to. We have the trees, we have catalog pages, and we have people, uh, the, the folks who participated, and we can talk with them, we can hear their stories. Um, so here's, here's uh, we're going to look at a bunch of these. So the, there it is the, on the left, the Evergleam. Kind of the, the most popular, probably about a six foot straight needle tree. Um, probably most popular if we use eBay today as a judge of what's still around and, and kind of extrapolate and assume that's a, just a distillation of what was produced. Uh, straight needle, uh, very, very popular. Uh, on the right, you see long needle, so slightly different, 33% uh, longer needles. So, you're, start, you're going to see that Lumen Specialty could make many, many tweaks and modifications to uh, uh, really to diversify their product. So here's a long needle swirl, silver fountain. So you're seeing they're doing treatments of the branches. It's just kind of like a diamond ring. More angles, more facets, reflect more light. And then on the on the far or excuse me on the right there, the fountain tree, their pom pom style treatments on the end of the branches. Here are their specifications. Uh, this is great documentation uh, in terms of information of what they're making, how they're making it. But then also, it, it's a little window into what they thought the value of their product was. And I'm going to look uh, in those kind of pink or light red boxes over here. Um, I'm challenged to either take my glasses off to look at that screen or to take my glasses off to look at this screen here. But what they're selling is sturdy and durable and safe uh, as well uh, as something kind of new and different. Each super hard, extra bright, aluminum branch, individually sleeve packed, you know, sturdy, safety tipped aluminum branches fastened firmly on rods with scotch tape. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then talking about the foil-covered hardwood trunks. From the curator's perspective, foil with tape, you know, you're killing us, right? We're, we're trying to keep these things around forever. It, uh, you have to handle these with care if you want to keep these things uh, intact. I doubt they ever thought in 50, 60 years people are going to be putting this in museums and someone's going to be in front of a room talking about them. Um, they may have used, I don't know, something a little, perhaps, actually more uh, durable. <clears throat> the diversification kind of continues. The tree on the left, the slim line you see up here at the upper right. So it's probably a six-foot tree, but they're using shorter branches probably that were sold on the two-foot or the four-foot. Not really much of a massive you know, change in their ability to produce or manufacture, but it's a completely different looking product. It's a new, I suppose, if you have small cramped space, something like that. Uh, on, on the far, or excuse me, on the right-hand side, all new for 62. It pretty much writes itself, I, I suppose, but you're starting to see, you know, you're looking at some of the accessories there, and I think in this next image you'll see some more. But first, on, on the left there, I think they attempted to, uh, the silver spruce, and it looks, it looks like it's just the, the branches were assembled in reverse. They're pointing down. <laughs> now, if that's an attempt to 
replicate a, a spruce tree as opposed to the more popular pine tree. Looks a little shaggy here in this image. Um, and on the right, you see a good, uh, great images here of the accessories. Uh, not just a stand, but a, a rotating stand. A rotating stand that played music. And then the, the key to what made these something you know, kind of special is the, the color light wheels. Uh, the intention, and you see in the marketing here, is that you to decorate, you splash colored light, or moving colored light. You move the tree, or you move the color, or you do both. And you play music with it, and animate these things, as opposed to hanging ornaments on a traditional Christmas tree. And so we don't have out this year, but we do have acquired, we have uh, the tri-lights, the turbo lights, the satellite. So clearly down here at uh, center right, the satellite playing up, S-A-T-A-L-I-T-E, playing on, on Space Age. This would be early 1960s. Uh, fairly simple. Um, we do have those in our permanent preservation collection, and what you'll see out here and in the front window are modern, up-to-date, modern wiring, <laughs> all that. We're, we're using, we want to, to show the effect, but we're not going to use vintage wiring, uh, products with vintage wiring. Uh, late in the 60s, uh, the, in response to these other manufacturers making more trees, perhaps better trees, higher end trees, uh, Luno Specialty introduced the, the True Taper, kind of their, their Cadillac, meant to be at a higher cost level because it's a higher level product. A uh, lot of branches, you can see the density there, uh, probably 139 branches on a six foot tree as opposed to maybe 91 branches. And then there are multiple, the first tree that has multiple sizes. So you get, uh, you do get a thick kind of appearance and there is one on the far wall. Uh, when, you, when you leave later, you can, and when you look at the forest of trees there, it, it sticks out, it's unlike the others. And then the, the frosty branch there, and that's just a lot of crimping on that aluminum, simple aluminum chaff that makes up a needle. Again, it just makes more angles, more spots for gleaming light. Uh, some, some wreaths. Again, aluminum, it's the same material, just fabricated a little differently, assembled a little bit differently. And then their product packages, these don't think a lot of them were made. Again, if we use eBay as an indicator of, of what's still around and what was then made, uh, these rarely show up. But there are two out here, right on the other side of that wall. Uh, and they are on loan to us from, uh, I pointed out Jerry Walk earlier, the head of sales. Uh, he has lent those trees for the show, as well as the uh, two footers in the case. They're those kind of those tabletop uh, trees as well. Uh, one of the last innovations to the aluminum Christmas tree are the dual color, blue green and, and burgundy blue. Uh, there is a spectacular one right out here when you come in. The, it's, a, it's a four footer, but it's color and it's condition. Uh, it just really pops. It you know, looks, it's far more, visually impressive than, than this catalog page here. And then the burgundy blue, I, am, I haven't heard from anybody that has ever seen one or have one surface on eBay or elsewhere. Um, if they, they made one, because they took a photo of it and put it in a catalog, <laughs> but uh, you know, maybe that's the, one of the last ones to be discovered, perhaps. So here we are, late 1960s. Uh, you see in the upper left there, that's not evergreen, that's evergreen. So they are transitioning to plastic and the latest, last one word, plastics, right? Uh, um, and, and this is, again, trims like a real tree. It's meant to be, to have that traditional look, but have the convenience of one tree. You don't have to grab one every year. It doesn't, the needles don't fall off. Um, so it's, it's kind of transitioning to that. Late 60s. Um, I imagine you know convenience is a major motivation for consumers, and that probably had a bit to do with the demise of the of the popu the massive popularity of the aluminum tree. So what do they look like in households and social media? Everyone pulls out their parents' pictures and sticks them up on the web, and parents have no idea that they're. Uh, <laughs> You look at these trees here, and I have yet to find a, a 
contemporary, a period image that shows one dimly lit with a color wheel on it. I suppose that'd probably be very hard to capture. What you see, what most people do, is have the aluminum, at least in the photographic record available in Pinterest and social media, at least in that record, um, is dec get the aluminum tree, but then decorate it like they had been other trees. <laughs> Lumina specialty didn't produce ornaments except for red bows. You'll see a red bow tree in the front window. And then there are the blue frost tips, and those aren't ornaments. That's just a different color treatment on the ends of the branches. So some, <laughs> some pretty great images uh, there. So why so successful? I ask this question a lot. A couple points I think that, uh, that we're, we're really comfortable with because we know the manufacturer's story very well. We've talked to a lot of these people, and it's probably easier to study that perspective than it is a million, two million, three million buyers' perspectives. Uh, usability and affordability. They did take modern coatings, which first to the marketplace, uh, but a little clunky, a little cumbersome. Luna Specialty knew that it had to be easy for a person to grab it off the shelf, put it in the cart, take it home, assemble it, uh, reassemble it, and they knew they wanted to, to get there. Um, and they were able to do that quickly in the early 60s, and we're going we're gonna to see um, exactly how that played out. Access to markets. Again, the company had been around for over 50 years. They had been, every year, they're going out and pitching the buyer from the Columbus, Ohio, Ben Franklin chain, and hey, have you seen this year? This is, this is the latest and greatest for 57. Or, um, and the, this is coast to coast. Establish sales networks. This is business. It's not quite widgets and gadgets, but that, it's similar kind of concepts here. Um, that was it. They were able to move a lot of product then fairly easily, fairly quickly. Uh, again, the, the innovation which I hinted to earlier, and then also you saw in those catalog pages the changes and the you know uh, um, all that somebody might want. I don't know a pink tree and and or a colored tree. So they made gold and green and pink, and then the uh, the dual color keep you know kind of keep moving. Um, I think. I know that they, they didn't, it wasn't a huge cost or effort for the company. They were to switch up their tooling or to switch up their process just a little bit could make a very different looking product. Um, and then from a consumer perspective, something different, and that's a phrase uh, Jerry Walk and others in, in, in Manitowoc like to say, um, Christmas decorations is a very traditional marketplace, and, and have been. You know, basically, the last big change was Coca-Cola branding Santa Claus red. You know, and then what, what has, you know, not a lot has changed. So in, if there is a segment of the market that was looking for something different besides the green Christmas tree and the strands of garland and then the strands of light later, um, this was very different, and maybe there's a market there that they could hit. Um, at the same time, it's consistent with, in the 1960s, kind of the emerging, emerging aesthetics of clean, metallic, you know, what today we love and call mid-century. Um, so they, they had something that's a little bit different out here in a traditional marketplace, yet was not completely in left field because they could kind of borrow from uh, aesthetic demands elsewhere in the, in the marketplace. And so, you know, is that why this is big? It hit, it hit perfectly right here? Perhaps, but ultimately you'd need to ask one million, two million, three million people why they bought the tree that, th that they did. Patent drawings are another good resource, research tool. Uh, here, when you look, filed in uh, September of 1958. Let me get over here. But uh, yeah, filed in September of 1958, and you see this is Clarence. Reese and some others that came up with this concept, they're calling it an artificial tree. Um, so Mr. Reese and some others put this together, and then by 1958 and 59, Modern Coatings in Chicago owned the rights to this copyright. So it's pretty simple drawings there. It's kind of the concept. You see that patent number at upper right. Here it is. Here, here it is right here. This is what made these trees so easy to use, the usability aspect. So what you're looking at are, uh, those are, those are the branches, and this has to do with you know, a long branch, medium branch, and a shorter branch, and this shows you where you would drill the holes and at what angle. 
So if this, this is the trunk, and that's vertical, and that's plumb, uh, this right here says 10 degrees. So that's 10 degrees off of plumb. And, you, and it progressively gets larger down here. That says 70 degrees. So 90 degrees would be horizontal, so it's just a little bit like this. So that means you take the trunk out of the box, put, put it at the stand, set it in place, and then one branch, one hole. There's no thinking. Just make sure you don't miss holes. You put it up, and when you're done, you have a tapered-looking tree. It's really simple, uh, ingeniously simple. There's high-res versions of these on the, you know, on our patent, U.S. patent uh, website. So this is what it looks like when you when you're assembling. This is right out here a couple years ago. These are Milwaukee Journal Sentinel images uh, when we did our last major show three years ago. Uh, we like to start assembling branches at the bottom. Some of these taller ones feel like be a little tippy. Again, these stands are not robust. Uh, and so um, uh, we like to start at the bottom and kind of work our way up. This is a 1959 aluminum Christmas tree made by Aluminum Specialty in its package after it was used. And this, I think, is a great uh, study in product packaging and usability. So you got the box, you had a cut along a dashed line, there's all these branches all out together, in, smashing into each other. They had bases, and you had to put each branch back in each base. Then you're done, you had to keep that plastic, not throw it out, hopefully. You put it over, and there's a cardboard piece on top. And it takes, you can see this out here, uh, we have this on display. You know, it takes three feet by three feet of storage space to store that. Uh, so the next major, the other major innovation is this. A, a one cent idea, a paper sleeve. And I'll pass this around. We'll, we'll need it back because a branch is going gonna, is gonna to go in this. <laughs> Start this around. A paper sleeve. This is what I, the points I love to make about like history. You, you just assume, oh, of course, they always had paper sleeves. Well, it seems so obvious. Now, someone had to think of it, produce it. And then, of course, the same gentleman here, or no, excuse me, different. Oh, here he is. He's back here. Clarence Reese, also part of this uh, as well. And this is a little bit later, but in uh, 60, 61, modern coatings also had the rights to this patent. So it made it super easy to store and protect. One way, always go the correct way. <laughs> You'll see a hands-on tree out there that you're welcome to uh, explore. And then you'll see what happens. We, we acquired it because it was a poor condition for use and hands-on. You see what happens if you jam them all in the other way. So what a simple, simple fix. So not only is it protected, but then you, here's just another drawing of what the packaging would look like, as well as a little more detail in needles. But then what that created was a much smaller storage system. 1959, six foot straight needle evergleam. 1961, 60, 61, six foot straight needle, the same tree. This is less, this is a quarter of the volume. It's far safer. You could pick this up. You, you could drop it. Oops, it, it, no big deal. Um, this, you know, this again, making a $1,000 idea into a million dollar idea. So it wasn't Luna Specialty's uh, brainchild, but they had the output ability, the nimbleness, the production capacity, the access to markets, and a little bit of capital to in, in, enter into a licensing agreement with uh, Modern Coatings, who didn't have what I just ticked off for Lumen Specialty, and voila. This case is right out here, back towards the back, and you can kind of see it's a great kind of study in importance of product packaging. And then this is the underside of one of those packages. So they hadn't branded it yet, so it's a stainless aluminum Christmas tree. Uh, not that exciting, but 94 ranch, so very typical. So the, uh, in the following season, after they'd sold a couple hundred thousand on a hunch, knew there was probably a winner idea here, uh, got the licensing arrangement with Modern Coatings, and then, you know, sure had the marketing folks put together kind of branding, and this is where they landed. The, the Evergleam softened it up with greens and red, white box, greens and reds colors, kind of traditional. Maybe that blue on white was a little, a little too much. Stark, uh, and then they haven't changed their pack, never changed their packaging throughout the run of their production. Uh, so that's a, a, 
uh, see a tree there, and this is from uh, one of the revolving stands, a, a box for one of the revolving stands in the collection. So I mentioned sales peaked about 1964. Co coincidentally, not, I don't know, but it, Loom Christmas trees were in the popular consciousness to the point where the peanuts gang got involved, so to speak, or at least Charles Schultz did. And so uh, this special, Christmas special, aired in December 1965, millions and millions of viewers to give you the quick synopsis. Uh, the Peanuts gang putting on their Christmas program. Charlie Brown is thinking, something's not quite right. We need a Christmas tree. And uh, Lucy thinks it's a fabulous idea that Charlie gets a Christmas tree. And, and I want to get this right. So, you know, get the biggest aluminum tree you can find, Charlie Brown. Maybe painted pink. Charlie, of course, sighs. And he grabs Linus and they head to the tree lot. And this is what they discover. It's just a large lot of presumably aluminum Christmas trees. And they start walking. You're looking at kind of two frames from the program. Uh, Linus flicks one of the trees as they walk by with his finger. Clank, real hollow metallic clank. That's not if you were to flick a tree. That's not at all how they sound. And Linus, in his manner, says, do they even make wooden ones anymore? <laughs> so, and we know how this goes when you, he, they wander through the forest of aluminum Christmas trees. And then we see in the far right... That, you recognize that one. And of course, Charlie Brown determines that that little tree in its glory uh, <laughs> better represented the true meaning of Christmas and picked that tree up to take it back um, to the set for their, to complete their um, program. Did Charlie Brown kill the Christmas tree, at, or the Luna Christmas tree? Uh, I, who knows? Again, we'd have to ask lots of people back then. Okay, um, I mentioned then that they kind of sat dormant until the, until the photographer artists in Manitowoc, uh, Johnny Shimon and Julie Lindemann, um, were documenting the Little Christmas Tree story. And, and here's a photo of uh, Richard Thompson from 1997 in his living room. That's it. That's the Alpha Evergleam. That's the prototype that they refined well enough to take to New York Toy Fair in our business, the alpha thing never exists. No one goes, oh, I've made it. This is going to become a huge seller, and we should probably put this in a closet and keep it sitting. That never happens. Well, uh, this, in this case, it has. And uh, Mr. Thompson has for every year always displayed it in his living room in Manitowoc. And this is a great photo from 1997. And here are uh, it's Julie Lindemann and Johnny Shimon. Uh, you mentioned instructors at Lawrence University, artists, photographers. Uh, Julie passed away a little over a year ago after a, a long bout with, with, with cancer. But it was their book, as seen on right, Seasons Gleamings, uh, that that's photo book that, that launched this. The book and the immediate attention. National media, uh, certainly. Um, here's our guy, Jerry Walk, and his wife, Jermaine. Um, a lot of this media, they came to Manitowoc to seek out the folks, and Jerry is tremendous in sales because he can tell great stories, and he, Jerry can still, he's a wonderful resource. And so they have a number of Evergleam products, and this is one in their home, in a four-footer uh, in their home in Manitowoc. Uh, CBS News Sunday Morning was the first national program that, in that December of 2004 to do a, a major segment on their, you know, a, five, six, seven minute extended feature. Uh, ABC World News, uh, World News Tonight, came here, they came to Manitowoc, they came here and did a, a, a piece for 2005, set up here. Um, and then since then, you know, certainly then, but then since then, um, ones that I'm very familiar with are, I would say, 50 plus local, regional, national, you know, uh, stories, media stories, not necessarily the social media, but uh, authors, photographers, photojournalists, um, and then, of course, these you know, syndicated coast-to-coast in print, when that used to mean something. Um, but that speaks to a resurgence. And then uh, here, more recently, um, it's a ubiquitous presence on the Internet. This is a screen grab of their lead-in to that CBS, Sunday morning, uh, CBS News Sunday morning show. In 2005, we published, researched, and, and put together an online kind of article uh, about the Evergleam story, and we led with the pink tree. We want clicks too. We want a, 
And um, that became essentially the, uh, the first um, researched, vetted piece on, on the history, and that has been replicated. Uh, and what that has meant is we hear from people all the time, all over. Um, because if you go to the internet, if you get past eBay and, and kind of other, uh, if you're looking for content, this is where you go. And we're happy to be that keeper of that story. Just a couple screen grabs from, from uh, you know, local news. You see Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Los Angeles Times, just indicative of, of, of interest. I've done many, many uh, television and radio shows. Folks who want to come here and folks who just want to, you know, the drive time from Fargo, North Dakota, where they just want to talk about the aluminum Christmas trees. Um, <laughs> that doesn't happen very often in the things that we do. We get a lot of local and regional coverage, obviously, but it's not often that um, stories where people want to just talk about it over the air, uh, and, and this, is, this is one of them. Social media is now uh, the place, and of course, Pinterest, and just hundreds and hundreds and thousands. Um, and this is where enthusiasts gather together and share. These are visually compelling things. You know, it's not like we're the, I don't know, the cigar crate capital of the world. You know, that, that's not quite as nearly as interesting and, and uh, conducive to online social media. Blogs and websites. There's a couple that I was just flipping through. And again, 20, the one on the left is 2015. It's a, it's a couple and their artists, and this is them last year, or they had a, a post on their, I don't, I don't, it could be anywhere in the world, um, and their Christmas in their home now features in a vintage Evergleam. The one on the right, I think it's from a, a Kansas 2008, you know, you, just all over the place you could pull these. I just grabbed a couple to share. And then and this one here, closer to home, you're seeing uh, Patty Pierce, who is about eight years old in this, in this photo, and uh, her older sister, Sherry, took this photo, you can tell, as a historian, because it's three, four feet high. It's not mom or dad shooting down. It's down here at that kid level. It's a four foot tabletop. And Sherry, a couple years ago, posted, uh, and these are uh, Sherry Pierce Thurner uh, out of Walworth County. These are her words. To be honest, I never thought I would wax nostalgic about a four foot aluminum Christmas tree, something my 10 year old purist self thought is an abomination. I love real trees. Tall ones that grazed the ceiling, smelled all piney and cold, and eventually got all prickly and brown and dropped all their needles into the carpet. I loved it when my parents added bubble lights and we got to toss on the silver icicles. And she starts explaining the details of the photo. Patty's holding a chatty Kathy. So that's about as 1960-ish Christmas as you can get there. Uh, and she concludes, in the 1950s and 1960s have receded far enough into the faltering memories of baby boomers and their surviving parents and are just history to everyone else. So that the decades have acquired something of a madman cachet. You know, I kind of mentioned that at the beginning. I almost wish, though, that I had one to put up today, but they've gotten too darned expensive. You know? Not an uncommon story with antiques or collectibles. I actually spoke with her recently, and, and uh, she wasn't able to make it today. Uh, other regional, national and regional, McHenry County is in suburban Chicago. Um, this is their exhibition last year. A lot of Evergleams, but any aluminum Christmas tree. Um, uh, actually, more than double the size of this one, uh, according to the, I didn't see it, I would have liked to. Um, these folks, they've been around a while, they're in North Carolina. Uh, I think they have a different take. We like to present them for what they are. The, they like to present them for what they they're interpreting the trees. Uh, last year in Manitowoc, Evergleams on 8th, uh, uh, a program with downtown retailers working with private collections, put aluminum Christmas trees in the windows and storefronts and visited. It looked wonderful at night and in the day. But really, uh, a huge part of this is, is eBay. It's, it's a place where people just go to window shop and see what's out there. It's how these things are rescued, salvaged, discovered in basements and attics, brought to the fore, because you can sell them, perhaps, or you can maybe say, you know what, that's really cool, I, for, I, I like this, let's put these up, or I remember these as a child, let's try this this year. Um, 
and, and, and as a historian, we use eBay. We're not appraisers and, and all that, but we use play, a marketplace like this to, to keep an eye on trends and all that. Um, what, what we definitely know, though, is uh, that the story isn't ending anytime soon. So why so enduring? Why do, we, why do we put that phrase in our tagline? The volume of production. It's, just, it's a numbers game. They made millions. Certainly thousands, tens of thousands, hundred thousand. Many still exist. The easy and protective storage, things stayed safe just inherently. Um, today, again, it's the same thing I think of the appeal in 1959 as today. It is something different. Christmas decorations are still very traditional. Um, Currently here in the 21st century, anything mid-century is highly collectible, highly desired, highly tradable. And as I mentioned, that, that online community and marketplace where enthusiasts gather together, share stories. Um, you, you look at the posts and then you read the comments below, just ticking through people from all over chiming in their memories. The irony being, some of the criticism at the time of Loom Christmas trees is that they were cold and commercial and uh, and for the folks we hear from today who love the trees, they're warm and nostalgic. <laughs> Maybe that's the effect of time. Um, so to revisit those first dates, uh, 1959, these were launched into production. They ended production about 1971. That's 12 years. 2004 is when Johnny and Julie published Seasons Gleamings. This is 2016. It's also 12 years. The, the second act is as long as the first act. But what's different now is that interest is not doing this. Interest is, is not waning. Interest is increasing in attention, media, social media, the marketplace, the, you know, the resale marketplace. Uh, how long will the second act go? I don't know. Um, but uh, it's been our pleasure to be able to here at the Wisconsin Historical Society Museum to kind of be part of not only of that sharing of the story, but in one way to be the keepers of the story as well. So to put on this production again this year, I um, encourage you here, and we'll be done shortly, to, to check it out. There is the photo opportunity in the corner, the 1960s vintage living room. Those are props we acquired, vintage material we acquired that you can plunk down, grab yourself an old fashioned, and, and have your photo taken for... Uh, <laughs> You can't spill it. Now I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little tip there. You can't spill it. Um, and maybe that's your photo for next year's uh, Christmas card. So I wanted to thank you for taking the time to come in on a, on a chilly day. And we'll have, uh, we'll have uh, questions here shortly. And I'll also be available uh, outside um, when we're all done. So thank you very much.